So we move, we move on to the, the last presentation of today, or uh, the last session. I co chair the, the session with uh, Esteban Lopez de Sa. And the session is on the secondary prevention in ischemic heart disease, in stable ischemic heart disease. The, the new data, the new, the new clinical trials data, how to implement in clinical practice this new data. And we move on to the next presentation, to the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Joao Moraes. Joao Moraes is a close friend of, of us, a close friend of mine for, for many years. He is the, the chief of the cardiology department in, in Leiria, in, in Portugal, and he's actually the, the, the president of the Portuguese Cardiac Society. So, thanks, Joao, for coming to Santiago. And the, the, the lecture is, what is the residu is residual risk and what can I do to reduce it in chronic ischemic heart disease? Joao. Thank you, Ramon, for this kind invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. And it's also a good opportunity to revisit some, some friends and uh, once again to establish some bridges between the Portuguese society and the cardiologist, Portuguese cardiologist and Spanish cardiologist. So my topic is about the uh, residual risk after good coronary symptoms and how to manage and how to handle this, this situation. So what's the problem? This is the problem. In our own experience in my institution, uh, at the end of the first year after acute coronary syndromes, around 40%, 14% of patients are suffering episodes of um, hydrothrombosis uh, or even deaths. 2.5% of patients are dying at the end of the first year. Um, th this, is, um, this is the same in other registries. This is the biggest registry in Sweden. And uh, what is important to emphasize on this slide, um, the, the event rate is, uh, is almost the same. All the registries are showing 12, 13, 14 percent of major events at the end of first year, but it's also important to emphasize that beyond the first year, the, the, the event rate is once again is increasing, is sloping, and at the end of four years, around 20 per, additional 20 percent of, of events. This is the mortality in the, um, the French registry, the fast in my in, in France, at the end of 10 years, mortality is around 40 percent of patients suffering acute myocardial infarction, and even in stable patients, not after acute coronary syndromes, in patients with um, stable conditions, ischemic heart disease, the event rate is also, is also very high. Mortality is not so high, of course, but the event rate, um, global event rates, death, myocardial infarction, stroke, rehospitalization, is very, very high at the end of four years. So th this is the problem. The second topic is how to predict the risk. We are using scores. Scores are very popular and guidelines, European guidelines are recommending scores to use to, to, to predict the risk in patients after acute coronary syndromes. The great score is our experience. The, the great score uh, is, is the better score because uh, the accuracy of great score to establish the risk is really is, is very good. But more recently, other tools have been developed at the EPICOR registry. Um, also show a new opportunity to, to, to assess the risk in patients after acute coronary syndromes with new models and uh, new, new risk factors to, to establish this, this score. But, um, and this score is, uh, it's a, sorry, it's a good, good discriminator of risk. It's possible to separate very high risk populations to the low risk, low, low risk populations. It's interesting, more recently, um, scores using in other conditions, the case of Chad score and Chad's VAS score, you are using in atrial fibrillation. These scores are also very useful in patients after acute coronary syndromes. We understand because congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, and history of stroke, of course, these, these different parameters are also good discriminators to predict the risk in patients with acute coronary syndromes. And in this experience, once again, in the French registry, it's possible to, to show that the accuracy of Chad's, Chad's VASC is not different from the, 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 grace, the GRACE score. So some contributors for this risk and what about the mechanism for the residual risk. 
We are discussing a lot about inflammation. Inflammation, we are discussing for a long, long time ago, inflammation. It's clear that there is a clear relationship between inflammation and, um, and the risk, even in general population. Um, CRP is a good discriminator um, to, to, to assess the risk and uh, to assess the inflammatory risk in the global population. But um, it's also a gradient of risk. It's not the same if the level of um, CRP is low or it is very high. There's a clear gradient of risk according to the level of CRP. And within the last um, 10, 20 years, we are trying to, um, to find good solutions to manage inflammation. We really believe in inflammation as the mechanism for, for the risk and the mechanism, not only for the residual risk, but also as the mechanism for acute events. But um, uh, it's a long, long story because a, lo a lot of initiatives clearly failed in, in the past. Very, very recently, Cantus, the Cantus trial um, testing the canakinumab this new anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, this trial is a really interesting trial. Uh, it's not an easy, it's a complicated trial in, in, in my opinion, but it's, um, it's good at least to test this hypothesis and to test this, this concept. In the, the Cantus trial, Kanekinumab has been assessed in different, in different doses in the large populations, um, exactly to, to try to assess the efficacy this anti-inflammatory drug in thrombosis outcome. This is the, the effect of canakinumab, different doses of canakinumab on the level of CRP. No, no effects on lipids um, as expected. And this is the main results of cancer trial showing that the rates of MACE and MACE uh, MACE plus, MACE plus means MACE plus hospitalization. Um, there is a clear reduction on the event rate. So this is very, very attractive. Uh, I think that we are doing a lot of discussions about uh, the implications, what are the implications of the Cantus trial um, in, in, in the future. Um, this is um, the first clinical trial with this kind of drugs showing a good, uh, good efficacy, a good benefit. And, um, as the lower the CRP level achieves, the better is the prognosis and the better is the effect. Lipids, um, lipids, we are discussing lipids for a long time ago. This is the residual risk in the IMPROVE trial. Once again, the residual risk is present at the end of three or four years, 10, more than 10% of patients, even in the, in the SATMI group with very low LDL cholesterol, the event rate is, once again, it still remains very, very high. And um, you, all of you are aware about this, um, this evidence. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitors are, are coming and two, uh, mega trials to real important trials, Fourier in stable patients and Odyssey outcomes in patients um, randomized after acute coronary syndromes. Both trials showed a clear benefit of PCSK9 um, in, in, this, in this situation. So this is opening a new avenue not only for research but also to manage very complicated cases in patients with very high levels of, um, of lipids, even with um, statins or statins plus azetimibe and so on. So a um, few words about glycemia. Glycemia, Dr. Aldo is um, addressing the topic of uh, diabetes in, in, this, in this symposium, only to remind that um, diabetes is doubling the risk in patients with um, the cardiovascular risk is double in patients with uh, diabetes. Uh, a lot of evidence on, on this particular, not only regarding coronary artery disease, but also particularly regarding stroke and, and, other, vascular, and other vascular deaths. So these are the, the metabolic components of diabetes. These are the, the, the major recommendations of uh, American Diabetes Association regarding um, hemoglobin, glycate hemoglobin, weight control, LDL, and, and blood pressure control, and these are the, the recommendations. There are new approaches to manage diabetes. Um, you are aware of this, particularly two groups of new groups of drugs 
the GLP-1 agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors are particularly efficacious in reducing blood glucose and are a very good contribution to control uh, diabetes in, in our patients. But what is really important in these clinical trials and see evidence, for the first time, um, an uh, anti-diabetic drug showed the clear benefits regarding events, particularly regarding the, the rates of death. Uh, Empagliflozin in the Empareg trial show a clear benefit reducing the risk of death around 50%. So this is a, a, a major impact um, in patients after acute coronary syndromes, and we are using these, these drugs. Finally, thrombosis. Tr thrombosis is another part of the mechanisms contributing to the residual risk in patients after acute coronary syndromes. Um, do antiplatelet therapy is the standard of care in patients after acute coronary syndrome, not only patients, stented patients, but even in patients medically treated. And European guidelines are absolutely clear, saying that in patients with acute coronary syndromes, treated with coronary stent implantation, do antiplatelet therapy with the PTY-12 inhibitor on top of aspirin should be recommended for, for uh, 12 months uh, unless there are contraindications such as excessive risk of bleeding. So we are not discussing this. We are discussing uh, the time duration of blue antiplatelet therapy because you have uh, some evidence showing that it's possible to extend the duration of blue antiplatelet therapy after acute coronary syndromes, particularly in more complicated cases. Um, and the benefits is present in different trials. Pegasus trials, an interesting trial, uh, randomizing patients uh, beyond the first year of myocardial infarction, between the first and the third year after acute myocardial infarction, showing the benefit of a small dose of ticagrelor, 60 milligrams per, um, 60 milligrams twice a day in, in this group of patients, the clear benefit. And also in the DAP trial showed almost the same results. Um, but the, the risk of bleeding is very high. All of you are aware of this, of this, this problem. The benefit is clear, but the, the risk is also very, very high. So we are discussing what are the proper patients to, to use this, this kind of strategy. More recently, we are testing uh, another opportunities. We know the, the, the role of thrombin in patients in, in, uh, in, a, in a thrombotic mechanism and the link between thrombin and, and platelets. And more recently, um, a new approach has been tested with the use of low dose of anticoagulants and the case of Rerox about 2.5 milligrams twice a daily. Um, this this, this uh, option was tested for the first time in Atlas ACS2 trial, showing the clear benefits on top of recurrent medications in patients after good coronary syndromes, showing including um, a clear reduction of CV death and even all cause of, of death. So this, this concept, the concept of the use of low dose of uh, rivaroxaban plus aspirin was tested in the COMPASS trial, and the COMPASS trial is a new opportunity to manage our, our patients. Uh, three arms, rivaroxaban 2.5 plus aspirin, uh, one arm with rivaroxaban 5 milligrams without antiplatelets, and antiplatelets um, plus pantoprazole, and the main results, this is the main result, the combination of rivaroxaban Low dose of rivaroxaban plus aspirin is showing a clear benefit in terms of reducing the major events. It's important also to emphasize that in this trial, we're enrolling patients with stable coronary artery disease and also stable peripheral artery disease, and the results in peripheral artery disease are also uh, very, very good. So this is the... the Sorry, the component of primary, the, the, the components of the primary endpoint showing the benefit on CV death, a clear reduction of cardiovascular deaths in patients managed with this combination. But once again, the, the price of major bleeding is present, exactly the same what happened in the Pegasus and other trials. When we, we are uh, reinforcing um, the use of antithrombins, you are getting more and more bleeding, and this is a matter of, of discussion. So these are then met, and this is my final slide, some key questions to, to be answered. Despite progress, patients who survive an acute myocardial infarction still remain at substantial risk. Um, risk stratification is challenging, and probably we need 
much better tools uh, to, to understand and to, to help us to manage these patients. A better definition about the transition period is needed. Um, this is really important because we are managing patients on the acute phase and we are managing patients with stable coronary artery disease. W when starts the stability of patients after coronary syndrome? We don't know exactly. Guidelines are recommending 12 months of one to platelet therapy and we interpret this as the stability starting at the end of first year. Of course not stability probably starting very soon and we don't know exactly when starts the stability and how to manage this issue. And finally, multiple pathways are being explored to improve long-term secondary prevention, not only antithrombotics, lipid lowering, anti-inflammatory, glucose lowering, and, and so on. And finally, this, this, this slide this is an interesting slide. Um, I would like to recommend you to revisit this, um, this manuscript uh, published by Dr. Alejandro Bringola and Hector Buen is here in, in the room. It's a, it's a very comprehensive approach of this problem, putting in a single cartoon the different parts of this problem. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Joao. Very good. Oops. Sorry. No, I'm still alive. With you, no, I'm still alive. I join. I join discussion at the end of the of the session. So we move on to the next presentation, and the next presentation will will be given by Jose Luis López Endón from Hospital La Paz, Madrid, and we will discuss the issue of. Uh, medical treatment and revascularization in patients with a stable angina. This is a, a great debate nowadays re related not only to the medical treatment, but also the revascularization. And Jose Luis has involved and is involved in many <coughs> clinical trials related with the disease. So it's a great opportunity of uh, having Jose Luis for discussing this issue. Jose Luis. Thank you, Jose Ramon. So is, uh, the topic now is uh, uh, stable angina, the role of medical treatment on revascularization. And uh, let me start with the problem. And the problem, if anything, is increasing, you know. And it is increasing especially because of the longer life expectancy in the population and uh, also because of the uh, lower mortality during acute coronary syndromes and uh, the lower mortality in patients with heart failure. But uh, this prospect from the WHO, you see that in 30 years' time, the number of patients with uh, a problem with quality of life secondary to a chronic ischemic heart disease has doubled and uh, in the future probably it will be the same at least for the next uh, 30 years. So we have a big problem here with a lot of people that is uh, presenting the disease and uh, curiously enough in spite of revascularization and medical treatment there is a significant number of patients that uh, uh, in, uh, in the chronic condition uh, are still presenting ischemia. This data comes from the clarified, tri uh, clarified registry. You probably have been even uh, involved in this registry. That is a contemporary registry in the European population in uh, selected sites and centers that are excellent centers for the uh, uh, management of these patients. And uh, in spite of that, 35 of the patients presented uh, chronic ischemia, uh, stable, stable myocardial ischemia. So uh, that is a surprise, but uh, uh, that is what we have. And uh, another important thing uh, to uh, settle the problem is that uh, nowadays we recognize that there is a significant number of patients with chronic ischemic heart disease, with severe, moderate or severe ischemia, and uh, without uh, epicardial coronary uh, obstructed lesions. This data comes from the ischemia trial and that has uh, been uh, completed in the inclusion, but uh, there is a, uh, there's still a follow-up of the patients. And uh, during the selection of the patients, uh, what was found is that uh, as far as much as 20% of the patients with severe myocardial ischemia or moderate myocardial ischemia did not present uh, epicardial coronary stenosis. So the problem of the components of myocardial ischemia has to be uh, uh, dealt with and uh, uh, we need a lot of investigation and research uh, to fix what is the uh, component that is predominant or what is the combination of the components for myocardial ischemia. It is not only the fixed coronary uh, flow limitation, it is also the endothelial dysfunction, metabolic abnormalities, thrombi, vasospasm, you name it. But uh, we need to know much more about this. And uh, if you start with the 
with the classical scheme for the uh, physiopathology of myocardial ischemia, the, uh, sup uh, the, the balance between the oxygen supply and demand, that is quite simple, but uh, we can make it uh, a little more complicated when we consider that myocardial ischemia itself may induce myocardial ischemia through uh, different mechanisms, one of which is the uh, so-called uh, calcium overload because of myocardial ischemia that uh, have some uh, influence in the, in the sodium canals and in the, the interchange of sodium with calcium. And this calcium overload is uh, uh, just uh, decreasing the oxygen supply and increasing the oxygen demand. And then we have also a direct metabolic abnormalities that may play an important role in some patients with uh, chronic ischemic heart disease and myocardial ischemia. So the full spectrum of uh, the physiopathology of this uh, disease is not a single one. It's a little complicated, but we have many opportunities to deal with, uh, with this syndrome. So we move to the treatment now, and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, something with the treatment that is uh, uh, of crucial importance. We have these three pillars, lifestyle changes or behavior, medical therapy, and revascularization. And the three of them are equally important. And ignoring one of them is an exercise in idiocy. So these three are equally important, and we cannot forget one of these three. And, uh, but there is, there is something that is quite interesting, and that is, uh, I, I'm going to tell you that. And uh, if you look at the CAS uh, um, study in the, uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, a, a revascularization, surgical revascularization against medical treatment, the optimal medical treatment in the 80s and 90s, you see that uh, with uh, um, surgical revascularization, there was a, a, a clear improvement in symptoms and uh, uh, the number of patients without angina after revascularization was really very impressive. But uh, time changes, and in the Courage trial, these differences uh, between, uh, in, in, the, in the number of patients with, uh, without myocardial ischemia, without angina, are very tiny and non-significant uh, after one year of follow-up. So my reading of that is that medical, optimal medical treatment has changed a lot probably with a change in the lifestyles, of the with a change in the control, for a better control of the risk factors and a better anti-ischemic treatment. But so comparing, uh, you know, myocardial revascularization with medical treatment nowadays is not the same as wha what we have 20 or 30 years ago. And again, let me move to revascularization. And in these stable patients with myocardial ischemia, but stable patients, I'm not talking about acute coronary syndromes, we have a number of contemporary trials, that is the Courage, the Vari2, the FAIN2, and the STITS. And uh, you know that uh, in the Courage, there was no difference between the optimal medical therapy and, uh, and uh, optimal medical therapy plus coronary revascularization with uh, a percutaneous coronary intervention. Yeah, the, I, I mean, I think that uh, the, the curves are very clear. The same with, uh, uh, in the VARI2 trial, in patients with chronic ischemic heart disease and uh, diabetic patients, not, uh, there was no difference between the optimal medical treatment alone or with uh, revascularization with PCI or revascularization with uh, uh, surgery. And uh, if we move to the FAME2 trial using this uh, uh, guide wire and uh, 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 you know um, perfusion pressure in the in patients. So exploring and selecting the arteries that uh, uh, should be uh, uh, revascularized. There is a trial that is positive in favor of revascularization, but uh, uh, we have a combined endpoint: all cause death, myocardial infarction, or urgent revascularization, whatever it is. And uh, but if we focus in mortality, that is surprising that. Uh, the mortality is really extremely low. It is only one year of follow-up, but the mortality is close to 1%. So I think that uh, it contrasts with uh, the data that has been presented by Joao Moraes. And uh, one thing that we should consider is that in clinical trials, we select the patients. And in these patients included in clinical trials present uh, a, a, a prognosis that is uh, invincible. You know, the, if the mortality in one year is uh, about 1%, it is impossible to reduce mortality. Especially because 50% of the mortality that, that, is, uh, that occurs during the follow-up in these chronic uh, patients is not secondary to 
cardiovascular diseases. It's secondary to cancer, to infections, to uh, trauma, to whatever, you know. So in the, in the, the information we get from the clinical trials may not really reflect the information we have in registries or from other sources. And if we move to a myocardial infarction, there is also the, the numbers are really very low without an impact in mortality. And there is no difference between the uh, group of patients with revascularization or without revascularization. The only difference in the FAME 2 trial is in the uh, prevalence or the, the need for, a, a revers for the revascularization. But at the end of the day, if you sum 100% of revascularizations uh, to start uh, with, with the follow-up, the number of patients that go through the CAD lab is much, much higher in the in invasive group. And then we have the STITCH trial that uh, is a trial for revascularization, uh, 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 surgical revascularization in patients with uh, myocardial ischemia, ischemic heart disease, and left ventricular dysfunction or heart failure. And uh, the first results of the trial were neutral or negative but it was because the follow-up was uh, uh, not uh, long enough. And in a longer follow-up, that is uh, up to 10 years, you see that uh, uh, revascularization of the patients with uh, left ventricular dysfunction and myocardial ischemia pays off in the long-term follow-up. But that is the only section, and uh, it does not apply to the patients with uh, myochronic uh, ischemic heart disease angina, but without heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction. So altogether, I don't think we have a clear evidence that uh, uh, myocardial revascularization should be considered in the, the full population of patients with chronic stable ischemic heart disease. And uh, uh, probably the, the answer to, uh, for selecting the patients, uh, part of the answer will be given by the, uh, by the ischemia trial that uh, uh, we will know the results uh, in a, in a few months, uh, this is still randomized patients to a revascularization or not in top of uh, optimal medical therapy, and there is a long follow-up that uh, will give you uh, the, the, an idea of what to do in a, a population that is much higher than in any trial that was performed up to date in uh, this uh, population of chronic ischemic heart disease in a stable patient. Meanwhile, uh, there is the, the guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology that may seem complicated, but uh, optimal medical therapy is uh, 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 offered for everyone. And then you have to select, or we have to select the patients that still present ischemia and uh, or have a very high risk. And uh, look that the very high risk here is a mortality of 3% per year. These will, would be the patients right now for uh, 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 to be selected for uh, uh, percutaneous or surgical revascularization. And what has changed a lot is uh, uh, the number of options we have for uh, uh, secondary prevention. And uh, you see here again from the last guidelines that in just uh, four or five years, in four years, we have a number of uh, 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 options or the strategy or compounds from the medical point of view that have demonstrated a benefit in patients with uh, chronic ischemic heart disease. We have from acetamide to anacetaprid, that was the last one that presented, or kananikinumab, that uh, uh, offer a, a, a better option for a, a secondary prevention in these patients. So uh, we have to digest all this information and optimal medical th uh, uh, therapy will be changing all the time. And uh, uh, optimal medical therapy nowadays is uh, considered as uh, 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 the, an amalgam between lifestyle changes, including smoking cessation and so on, nutrition, exercise, and uh, a list of pharmacological compounds that may be used in these patients with chronic stable ischemic heart disease. And uh, it is important because uh, when you explore uh, the outcome of patients that uh, in this condition that uh, somehow are not receiving or discontinue some of the classic medications, antiplatelet therapy, statins, beta blockers, and its inhibitors, there is an increase in mortality. So that is something that uh, uh, has to be considered. Uh, optimal medical therapy may not be enough in some cases, but uh, optimal medical therapy should be there. Because if uh, we discontinue the medication or the patient discontinues the medication, there will be an increased uh, uh, probability of, of, of mortality. 
And uh, so what is optimal medical therapy anyway? So that is a changing concept. Just a few years ago, optimal medical therapy was giving the patient all the drugs that were, uh, uh, that had demonstrated a benefit anyway. So aspirin, beta blockers, um, statins, and so on. It moved to an optimal medical therapy, target-oriented, not only to give the drugs, but to control the risk factors or to control myocardial ischemia or angina. For instance, it is not the case for giving ACE inhibitors. It is controlling blood pressure. It is controlling uh, LDL cholesterol and so on. Then another step forward is the so-called Taylor, Taylor therapy that considers the comorbidities to make the selection of the drugs that are more uh, uh, suitable for a particular patient. And uh, then we come to an age of precision medicine where we can uh, genotype the patients and identify the patients that uh, would be responding to a particular medication or not. So we can tailor the therapy with precision medicine and it is coming soon. So let me move again to the uh, list of uh, medical therapy to control ischemia. This is the guidelines, beta blockers or uh, calcium channel blockers. And then the, there is a second line. Uh, we have in this scheme of physiopathology opportunities for all the, uh, the groups of drugs we, dr we have. And we have drugs for uh, all the particular mechanism that is uh, uh, playing a role in uh, producing the myocardial ischemia. So uh, there is a, a selection of the, the selection of the, of the medical treatment should be according to the predominant mechanism that uh, is playing an important role in a particular patient. In any case, I think that what we have now, we, call, we could call it the seven magnificence that uh, are uh, nitrates, uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, trimetacidine, nicoraldine, ibabrodine, and ranolacine. But, uh, you know, nitrate, we are using nitrates, and nitrates were first introduced in clinical practice in the year, exactly the year that Abraham Lincoln was elected uh, President of the United States. And uh, uh, to make it uh, a, a long story short, I would tell you that the seven magnificence are all dead. So maybe we need some more clinical research here and find new drugs, or uh, make something, make a selection, and see if what has been demonstrated with nitrates or beta blockers is still having the same effect today when rehabilitation plays a role with revascularization in uh, the majority of the patients, with the statins in all the patients, with aspirin and so on, maybe we don't have enough information for using the older drugs. But uh, that is what we have. And uh, in fact, none of these seven magnificence play a role in improving uh, uh, the outcomes of the patients in terms of reducing mortality. And uh, that is, so that is exactly the same with uh, myocardial revascularization. And uh, uh, so uh, the next step is uh, to uh, control or to consider the comorbidities, to uh, select the more appropriate drug for a particular patient. And uh, there is a long list of comorbidities and a long list of opportunities for uh, selecting the patients rather than using calcium channel blockers or beta blockers as a first line or something like that. So, for instance, in patients with heart failure, calcium channel blockers will be contraindicated, beta blockers will be a must, uh, uh, ibabradine will be uh, also a, a good option in the patients in silent rhythm, and so on. So, considering the, the comorbidities, uh, is we can make a better choice of the particular treatment that uh, may be the, uh, the, the, the special treatment for a particular patient. Or we can consider the hemodynamic status of the patient, for instance, the heart rate and the blood pressure, and we should use uh, uh, drugs that reduce heart rate if there is a, a tachycardia or if the heart rate is in sign rhythm about 60 beats per minute, and the same with blood pressure. If the blood pressure is uh, normal or above normal, we can use beta blockers or, uh, or uh, calcium channel blockers, but if the blood pressure is in uh, is borderline or is low, uh, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers will not be the, the first option. The first option would be maybe ranolacine or trimetacidine. So altogether, I think that uh, stable coronary artery disease is still uh, presenting uh, an important social and medical problem with a, a, a significant economic impact on the, uh, on the expenditure in, uh, in healthcare. 
there is a new uh, entity that is, uh, has been uh, named Inoka or Inoka that is uh, uh, ischemia without uh, uh, epicardial coronary stenosis, lifestyle, and uh, is, is uh, extremely important. I don't have time to talk about that, but it is not only the responsibility of the physician, it is the, the responsibility of the patient itself, himself, and uh, it is a social responsibility. Revascularization needs a better selection of candidates and prevention therapies are effective. We have to digest the new opportunities we have and uh, therapies with new mechanisms for action should be considered in everyday clinical practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. I'm going to introduce you the, the next speaker. The next speaker is Antonio Vallejo Vaz. Uh, although he is the youngest person in this session, He's a real expert in these lipidemias, and especially in the new lipid-lowering drugs. So he's working in the Imperial College of London. So please, Antonio. So, thank you very much. So thank you for your invitation to contribute to this session. So in the interest of time, let's start. So going right to the point, uh, the European uh, Society of Cardiology and Atherosclerosis Guidelines uh, recommend for well, classify uh, patients with coronary heart disease as very high-risk patients, and as such, the, they are indicated to, to reduce the LDL cholesterol to, to less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, or at least 50 percent, in case that LDL is uh, between 70 and 135 milligrams per deciliter. So they recommend a prompt, intensive, and usually prolonged statin therapy. So a key, point, a key point I think is worth mentioning is about this consensus paper on the role of uh, LDL cholesterol as, uh, a causa, as ca causal for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So in this large meta-analysis, so including Mendelian randomization studies, prospective cohort studies, and randomized control trials, uh, it was observed that there is a consistent dose-dependent uh, association between the absolute magnitude of exposure of LDL cholesterol and the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. This uh, risk increased with the, duration, with the duration of the exposure, and it was independent uh, of the mechanisms by, by which, uh, by which uh, LDL is, is lowered. Uh, Mendelian randomization studies uh, suggest this, and when uh, a study uh, genetic variants that mimic uh, the, uh, the current treatments that we have, like a study in Cetimab PC skin inhibitor, it was uh, observed that per unit, uh, per unit uh, of uh, LDL cholesterol, the risk was, was similar. So, and for every one millimole per, di per, uh, per liter reduction in LDLC in, in LDL, uh, it reduces uh, in re per, sorry for every one millim millimole per liter reduction in LDLC, uh, CV risk was re is reduced by 20 25 percent, and it it is independent of the mechanism by which LDL cholesterol is is reduced. And it, is, it happens for both secondary prevention and for uh, primary prevention trials. So, uh, um, LDL cholesterol is important not only how high it is, but also how, for how long it has been uh, high. So, the, fir uh, the first line therapy in this patient are going to be maximally tolerated dose of statins and usually high dose intensity statins, as previous, previous studies have, have shown in these trials in this patient with coronary artery disease. So, there is residual risk, as uh, has been already mentioned before. So then what? what? What are the options we have? Uh, there are some uh, several groups that may uh, benefit for LDLs, for further LDLC lowering, like uh, patients with high absolute cardiovascular risk or established cardiovascular risk, and a high LDL cholesterol despite uh, maximally statin therapy, patients intolerant to statins, uh, and familiar hypercholesterolemia patients. In this point, I think it's worth mentioning the, the relationship between familial hypercholesterolemia with coronary artery disease. As you know, FH is a life uh, results in a lifelong elevation of LDL cholesterol and premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in Eurospire, uh, for, uh, for example, up to one in, in five patients with myocardial infarction before the age of 50 years could have potential familial hypercholesterolemia. And for example, in this study, recent study in Spain, in patients with acute coronary syndrome below 65 
five years with an LDL about 160 milligrams per deciliter, the prevalence of genetically confirmed FH was as high as 8.7 percent. In patients in, in, in the lower study in Italy, in patients referred to cardiac rehabilitation center because of coronary heart disease. Uh, patients with premature coronary heart disease uh, were uh, had a prevalence of 10 percent for familiar hypercholesterolemia. So in patients with uh, CHD, FH must be considered. So what are the options we have then? We have estetimib and PCSK9 inhibitor. It has been much uh, discussed already in previous sessions. So in the improved trial, estetimib uh, added to simvastatin uh, compared to simvastatin alone reduced uh, the, the levels of LDL cholesterol, and it translated into an approximately 6 to 7 percent risk reduction in major coronary, major cardiovascular events. A recent analysis from the improve it classifying the patients whether they have high risk, intermediate or low risk, found that uh, patients with, with high risk uh, could benefit more for, from this combination therapy. It was a, a found a 6.3 percent absolute risk reduction at seven years in those with high risk, and for example, it was 2.2 in intermediate risk. With respect to PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, there has been before uh, a full session on this, so I'm going to, to, to go a bit uh, fast in, in the interest of time. So PCSK9 inhibitors have consistently uh, reduced uh, LDL cholesterol in different situations compared with placebo, compared with acetimib. Uh, in some studies, it has also been suggested that it could also reduce the, the percentage of, of plaque atheroma volume. So, uh, currently, we have now the, the result from cardiovascular outcome trials in relatively short, short time since it was uh, first discovered. So in Fourier, over 70,000 uh, people, um, the vast majority of them with history of myocardial infarction, and some of them also with other atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and Odyssey outcome with almost 19,000 people post-acute coronary syndrome, approximately median of two months after the, the, the event. So patients who are in the Fourier trial, patients who are randomized to Evolocomad or placebo, and the median follow-up was 26 months. Uh, at 48 weeks, 59% uh, mean reduction in LDL cholesterol was observed with, uh, with placebo, with, sorry, with Evolocomad versus placebo, and it translated into a reduced uh, a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular event by approximately 15%. And in key secondary endpoints as well, uh, by approximately 20 percent, uh, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. A number of su uh, a number of, of additional subgroup uh, study uh, subgroup analysis have been carried out. This is, for example, based based on time, and uh, it could happen that the uh, the benefit could be uh, better at 25 percent risk reduction from the first year onwards compared to the first 12 months. In patients with, patients with multivessel disease could, uh, could benefit more from, from, Ebo, from Ebolocumab with a, a reduction in 3.4 percent compared to 1.3 when patients do don't, don't have multivessel disease. Or, for example, patients who have a high, uh, high risk facial of myocard or for myocardial infarction that like a, a short a shorter term since the index myocardial infarction, more than two myocardial infarction or residual multivessel disease. So these are just an, some examples where we can see that probably patients with, with high risk can benefit most, more from, from treatment with PCSK9 inhibitors. Then we have the Odyssey outcomes where patients were uh, allocated to early or, early or placebo and follow up by a median of 2.8 years and over 40 percent with potential with follow up above three years. As it has already mentioned in previous session, this, this, uh, the aim of this trial was to, to get a, a cholesterol within a, tar a range, a target range, and uh, treatment was, uh, was adjusted to based on LDL cholesterol levels to, to fit within this range between 25 and 50 milligrams per deciliter. At one year, uh, a 61 percent was uh, with alirocumab versus placebo was observed on LDL cholesterol, and it was maintained over time as well. And it translated into a reduction of 15 percent in the in maize as the primary efficacy endpoints, and absolute risk reduction of 1.6 percent. 
There were it was also also observed a, a number a reduction in other uh, in other points like for example CV CV event or, and also all, all cost death as it has already been mentioned maybe the the lack of uh, significance in CHD deaths and CV deaths so the trend maybe it's because of the low number of, of events. And in this uh, pre-specified subgroup uh, with LDL cholesterol uh, below 80, 80 to 100, or above 100, it was observed that patients with uh, uh, LDL cholesterol above 100 milligrams per deciliter at baseline may benefit the most from this, uh, from this drug. So in patients with cardiovascular disease, PCS can inhibitors, uh, al el evolocumab, alirocumab, uh, compared to placebo, reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. Patients at higher risk or with higher LDL cholesterol may benefit the most. And overall, they were safe and well tolerated, apart from injection side reactions, and also including uh, when low LDL cholesterol levels uh, were achieved. Uh, this has been a point of, of concern, and just as an example, this was an exploratory analysis in Fourier with Evolocumab in patients who achieve an LDL cholesterol below 10 milligrams per deciliter, and there were still benefit in cardiovascular efficacy endpoints, and there was no difference in safety. In, 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 safety. in 2017, there was uh, the, the ESC and EAS uh, published this update, uh, update uh, current opinion on PCSK9 inhibitors. This was after the main results from, from Fourier were published, and maybe there are some points that can be discussed. Uh, so they identified three groups where PCSK9 inhibitors should be considered. First, patients with cardiovascular disease with substantially elevated LDL cholesterol despite maximally tolerated statin or cetimibe. Uh, also based on different uh, risk indices, and you can see that they consider LDL substantially elevated LDL as above 140 or above 100, based on whether there is uh, severity in the risk severity indices or not. So it, it could be a point to discuss if this is too, too high or not. Also patients with familiar hypercholesterolemia with high LDL cholesterol level, whether they have or no uh, coronary art, uh, cardiovascular disease. Or, and of course, patients uh, with statin intolerance, provided that the, it has been uh, pro appro proper, uh, appropriately checked that the, the, the intolerance is as such by, by trying at least three, three statins. So we have ethetima and PCS skin and inhibitor, and uh, as it has been uh, ma discussed much in detail in a, prior, in a prior session, there are a number of, of, of factors that can, that, that may be considered. Uh, for example, the, the, the reduction in LDL cholesterol that, is, that must be needed and the intensity of the drug in terms of percentage reduction that can be achieved, whether they are uh, patients with high, uh, with high risk, Obviously, availability and cost, that may be the, uh, the most important factor limiting PCSK9 inhibitor use. Also, the, adher the adherence to medication, of course, patient preference. So what are other recent trials? So in the uh, recently have been published a result from PCSK9 synthesis inhibitor. The, these, uh, these drugs uh, blocks the synthesis of PCSK9 and in the Orion trial, that was a dose finding study in high cardiovascular risk patients. One, one injection, or here, two injections, one at baseline and, and the second one at 90 days, uh, uh, got a su sustained uh, LDL cholesterol reductions. So uh, probably, uh, longer studies will need further injection, probably maybe every three months. All patients uh, uh, responded to a median response of 52.6% reduction in LDL cholesterol at day 180, and this may be um, important because in some studies it has been that it has been that there is a, a important variability in LDL cholesterol, and variability in LDL cholesterol is associated with high cardiovascular uh, this risk as well. So moving to HDL cholesterol, recent, uh, with treatment with CEP, uh, with CEP inhibitors before with torcetrapil, dalcetrapil, and evacetrapil, uh, before have no found a, a benefit in terms of cardiovascular disease or mortality. Recently, uh, it was published the reveal trial with anacetrapil, where patients with atherosclerosis, uh, with atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease and acetrapil reduced the risk of major coronary events by 9% over four years of follow-up. However, it has been discussed 
it has been discussed that much of this uh, effect could be uh, due to, to reductions in ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol rather than to the elevations of, of HDL cholesterol. In fact, it fits well with the, with the regression curve with non-HDL cholesterol, line, sorry, with a non-HDL cholesterol, and there are some, gene some genetic studies with, uh, with SEP uh, uh, variants that also suggest the, it, the effect is largely dependent on, on LDL cholesterol-related factors rather than LDL. With respect to triglycerides, they, it, they are a marker of increased risk, and there are some, uh, some cardiovascular disease outcome trials uh, ongoing. Some of them include patients with cardiovascular disease uh, and coronary heart disease, so let's see what, what the, the results are. In the, in the support of, of potentially going through, through triglycerides is, is, this, is a study that has been published in triglyceride-rich lipoprotein particles. Well, including kelomicrons and remnants, VLDL and IDL. In, in post-hoc analysis from the TNT trial, the triatomy with atorvastatin reduced uh, reduce the levels of triglyceride-rich lipoprotein cholesterol to a greater reduction with uh, the highest statin dose, atorvachenta versus atorvan 10 milligrams per deciliter. And it was observed that more intensive statin therapy resulted in a significantly greater cardiovascular risk reduction among patients with higher TRLC levels or higher triglyceride levels with a heterogeneity significant. So it may support to, to also go the, in this way, but further results, are, further uh, studies are needed. Uh, with respect to TRLC, what is not clear is whether it's, are the triglycerides contained in this particle or the cholesterol content in this particle what may uh, uh, lead, uh, lead to, the, to the increased cardiovascular risk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. <laughs> now, it's an honor for me to introduce the last speaker of this session. It's Aldo, Ma Aldo Maioni from Italy. And only for those who uh, are very young, uh, young cardiologists, Aldo uh, was uh, one of the leaders of the, probably one of the most relevant trials in cardiology, that was the GC trial in the 80s, that together with the ISIS-1 trial changed the way that we manage uh, acute myocardial infarction. So it was introduced to the new era for cardiology. So Aldo now is going to speak about diabetes. He was also responsible for all the, almost all, the registry of the European Society of Cardiology. So Aldo, please. Uh, thanks a lot, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, for the, uh, to have invited me here uh, in Santiago de Compostela for the nice introduction. Uh, these are my disclosure and the disclosure of my for the institution uh, for which I work. And uh, the aim of my presentation is to discuss how uh, diabetes should be treated in order to prevent uh, uh, cardiovascular ischemic events. And I would like to start uh, with the traditional paradigm. Uh, the traditional paradigm is based uh, on the uh, possibility to prevent a cardiovascular ischemic event with uh, a more aggressive uh, glucose lowering approach. Uh, to test uh, this hypothesis, four trials have been uh, conducted more than uh, 10 years ago, and uh, this trial randomized a lot of patients, as you can see, and uh, uh, the uh, randomization was not for specific drugs, but for specific target of uh, A1C or glucose. Uh, as you can see, uh, the targets were very low uh, in all the trials, and actually uh, it was possible uh, to see that uh, with uh, the aggressive approach it was possible uh, to reduce uh, the levels of fasting glucose or uh, the level of A1C. But uh, which were the results of this trial? Uh, as you can see, there was a small and modest reduction in terms of major uh, cardiovascular events, the usual uh, maze, uh, cardiovascular uh, mortality, non-fatal infarction and non-fatal stroke. There was a small reduction in myocardial infarction, but uh, uh, there was no evidence in the reduction of cardiovascular death or all-cause mortality. Uh, actually, uh, the trial were followed up for several years, 
and after a very long period of time, uh, there was a demonstration that it was possible to see a reduction of so in all cause mortality in the UK PDS trial and also in the uh, cardiovascular event free survival in the VAT trial, but just after a very long period of time. So the conclusion regarding the traditional paradigm, uh, the era of the intensive glucose lowering, is that uh, there is a clear uh, demonstration of the possibility to prevent microvascular events but uh, a modest effect on the prevention of macro macrovascular event was demonstrated and no effect at all uh, on the, the reduction of cardiovascular or all-cause death. Uh, then there was uh, another uh, era. Uh, new anti-diabetic drugs were tested, but uh, f at the beginning there were some safety, some safety concerns and uh, the FDA uh, took a decision that... Uh, uh, resulted in a revolution in the uh, research of anti-diabetic drugs in order to prevent cardiovascular events. Uh, the uh, problem was related mainly to two drugs, muraglitazar and rosiglitazon, that were associated uh, with an increase in cardiovascular events. For this reason, in 2008, uh, the FDA decided uh, that uh, to uh, have the possibility to register a new drug uh, for or to maintain on the market a drug uh, for um, the treatment of diabetes, it was necessary to do larger trial in order to demonstrate the uh, safety uh, of this uh, new drug. Uh, after this uh, decision, uh, there was an impressive increase in the number of trials and even more in the number of patients included in trial. As you can see, uh, starting from 2008, uh, when uh, the FDA took the decision, the number of patients included in trial increased exponentially. And uh, uh, the era of the large-scale clinical trial to prevent relevant cardiovascular events in diabetic patients started. And uh, a lot of trials were planned, testing different classes of anti-diabetic drugs, and for each class of drug there were different agents. Uh, the uh, patients included in these trials were generally patients at very high risk, patients with type 2 diabetes with an history, a documented history of coronary artery disease, in some cases also patients with diabetes and, uh, and, I, uh, and uh, several uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In some trials, just patients with a recent acute coronary syndrome were enrolled, and in a minority of trials, also patients with heart failure uh, were included. Uh, the other observation is that almost all these trials were non-inferiority uh, trials, in the sense that uh, the primary aim of this trial was to demonstrate the safety of the drugs, and uh, uh, in general, if uh, the uh, non-inferiority uh, objective was met uh, by the trial, a superiority analysis uh, was performed. Uh, let's start with the DPP-4. The DPP-4 were tested in several trials, and uh, the final results, DPP-4 met the primary endpoint of non-inferiority, but there was no evidence of superiority of this drug with respect to placebo, and also some concern uh, were observed regarding heart failure events in the sense that the hospitalization for heart failure increased with the use of this drug. Uh, then the GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, were tested and uh, uh, after the publication of the actual trial, uh, we published this uh, meta-analysis of the four trials testing GLP-1 receptor agonist in order to prevent uh, cardiovascular events. And as you can see, with respect uh, to the classical three-point maze, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke, uh, putting together the data of the four trial, uh, there was an evidence of an association with a reduction of uh, this uh, uh, composite endpoint. And the same was true for cardiovascular mortality. Uh, in any case, as you can see, the direction of the effect was similar more or less uh, in all trials, with the exception of ELIXA, but probably uh, for a different reason, ELIXA uh, included just patients with a recent acute coronary syndrome, 
and uh, uh, the uh, uh, time to obtain a beneficial effect of this kind of drug probably is longer and uh, during the first phase of the trial uh, the uh, events were not affected by the treatment so the final uh, result were diluted by the events occurring uh, earlier after the beginning of the study. Uh, going uh, uh, along the same uh, meta-analysis, uh, there was uh, a trend favoring uh, the uh, use of GLP-1 receptor agonist in terms of fatal or non-fatal infarction and a trend uh, in terms of fatal or non-fatal stroke. But uh, uh, the uh, conventional level of statistical significance was not reached for this uh, endpoint. Uh, while uh, there was uh, an evidence of uh, a reduction of all-cause mortality. As you can see, there was a 12% reduction of all-cause mortality uh, statistically significant. So, for the first time, uh, uh, there was the demonstration that with this class of drug, uh, it is possible in some way uh, to prevent cardiovascular mortality in patients with uh, diabetes. Uh, finally, uh, there is another class of drug, the, SG, uh, the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, and also in this case, two trials have been published. The first trial was the EMPAREC trial, already mentioned by uh, our colleague Joao Moraes before, and uh, with this drug it was possible to reduce by 14% uh, the occurrence of the classical three-point maze, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and uh, uh, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, as you can see, diverged quite early after the beginning of the treatment that uh, uh, this uh, uh, beneficial effect, it is difficult, in my opinion, to be explained just by the glucose-lowering effect of this drug that is uh, quite uh, uh, modest. Uh, there was also an impressive reduction in terms of all-cause mortality, uh, more than 30% reduction, clearly uh, statistically significant. And again, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve started to diverge quite early and continue to diverge for the full uh, course of the trial. Uh, this... Uh, uh, data were confirmed by another trial, the CANVAS trial, testing another drug of the same class, canaglifozin, and again, uh, the uh, primary endpoint of uh, cardiovascular uh, dead non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI was uh, favorable, 14% reduction, statistically significant, and uh, uh, the same result was obtained uh, as in EMPAREG with respect to uh, uh, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI. Uh, very recently, just uh, this week, an overview was published because there were no uh, direct comparison between the two classes of drug. And uh, uh, I think this is an interesting systematic review and meta-analysis just published. Uh, the connecting lines uh, are uh, the comparison between the different group, the control, the GLP-1, the DPP-4, and the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, the dimension of the connecting lines uh, is, uh, reflects uh, the uh, number of trials testing the comparison, and uh, the dimension of the circles uh, reflect the number of patients in the different groups. And uh, the result can be seen here. Uh, with respect to the control on cardiovascular mortality, no effect of DPP-4, and the favorable effect of these two drugs two classes of drug, GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitor, so a confirmation of uh, the existing uh, trial. And uh, in the uh, smaller number of trials comparing directly uh, these classes of drug, there was a confirmation that with respect to DPP-4, uh, there was a beneficial effect of GLP-1 and SGLT2, and uh, less data also because the trials are very uh, in a very small number, uh, there were be between the comparison between SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 antagonists, and uh, the association was not statistically significant. With respect to all-cause mortality, again, a confirmation that uh, these two classes of drug were favorable with respect to control, and DPP-4, no, and comparing 
these classes of drug with TPP4, it seems that there is a superiority of GLP1 and SGL2 with respect to DPP4. With respect to myocardial infarction, uh, the results are less, uh, uh, are less encouraging in the sense that uh, uh, for the majority of the comparison, there were a neutral association, while for heart failure events, uh, there are very promising data uh, with respect uh, to uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors that seems to be superior to the other classes of drug. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, uh, today there is a trial ongoing testing this class of drug uh, versus placebo, also in patients without diabetes. Uh, also because the uh, favorable effect of this class of drug is probably uh, not yet uh, very clearly explained and it is really difficult to be explained just by the reduction of uh, glucose or a A1C. So uh, in conclusion, I think that the international guidelines on the treatment of diabetes and cardiovascular prevention should be updated according to the result of recent uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, the uh, ESC guidelines regarding general prevention has been published in 2016. Uh, before the publication of a large number of the trial that I show you. Uh, no, this uh, guideline should be updated because today we have new agents able to improve patient cardiovascular outcomes. And further studies are necessary, in my opinion, to understand better the mechanisms of the favorable effect of GLP-1 and in particular of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, because it is difficult to understand why there is this clear beneficial effect and very early after the beginning of the treatment. And uh, in practical terms, the fruitful collaboration between cardiologists and diabetologists that we observed in randomized clinical trial should be concretely expanded to daily clinical practice. And I have to say that up to now, this collaboration is not so good, at least in my country. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So thank you, Aldo. Please, may we come to the, to the table. Joao, Jose Luis, and Antonio, and Aldo. We have time for some discussions, some, from, some questions. Uh, any question from, from the audience? Uh, yeah. Dr. Pardaji. This is a question to Jose Luis Lopez Sendon. What is your opinion on this change in the primary endpoint that uh, investigators of uh, ischemia trial has decided recently? And second, how do you interpret the uh, Orbita trial? He, he loses his ear. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Estaba distraído. The reasons why for changing the primary, the primary endpoint of the ischemia trial. The ischemia. And your opinion well, of the yeah, the, trial. Two, two interesting questions. The ischemia trial primary endpoint was changed, not in the middle of the night. The ischemia trial primary endpoint was changed because it was a, tough, a, a decision made by the uh, executive committee and the scientific committee on the basis that uh, the recruitment had to be closed in a particular day because the funding from the National Institute of Health was, uh, uh, you know, demanding that, you know. But if you look at, if, if you, look at if you have a look at uh, a number of tri recent trials, there is uh, more often than not a change in the primary endpoint or a change in the number of patients to be included in the trial. That is, that is something. So there is nothing wrong with... Uh, you know, it, it was not a manipulation to favor the results of whatever results in the, in the ischemia trial. The second question is more interesting, and that is the, the, the interpretation of the ORBIT trial. And uh, the ORBIT trial uh, <coughs> uh, was comparing revascularization against uh, non-revascularization non with a SAM procedure. So the patient was thinking that uh, he was revascularized, you know, and the study was neutral. So the first problem, the, the main, listen, the main uh, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, um, conclusion for that is that, uh, or, uh, or the thought for that, is that uh, the power we have as physicians 
on the outcome of the patients is incredible. And we are probably not using that all the time, you know. But uh, if we say something really uh, trying to convince the patient, we can convince the patient. So that is the first thing. The, se the second thing is that the study was too small to establish conclusions. And uh, if anything, it only points that, uh, you know, revascularization of stable patients as a routine is not really a very good clinical practice. Other questions? If not, uh, I, I would like to, to, to make a question to, to Aldo regarding the, the, the best options in coronary patients for treating diabetes. What do you think about the combined treatment with uh, glyphosine and GLP-1 agonist uh, inhibitors? What do, you, agonist, what do you think about this combination? Yeah. Theoretically, yes, okay. uh, theoretically, I think that uh, uh, the association is possible and uh, probably is also beneficial. Uh, I have to say that unfortunately we have no, or okay. not yet yeah. at least, a trial comparing one of the two agents versus the combination. Yeah. Probably yeah. the best trial should be a trial with three arms, the two drugs alone and the combination. Yeah. But uh, we have actually no data. But theoretically, due to the mechanism of action, it yeah. is very logical to put together the two drugs. Uh, Any question? I'd like to make uh, another question to, to Antonio. Uh, we have discussed previously the role of PCSK9 inhibitors. And this question would be a question for all of us that what, what is your, your expectations? But the, the problem is the different health scenarios. But in, in Spanish health, health scenarios, that is more or less the same that in Italy and, and in Portugal. What do you think about the, the, the role, the, the real role of PCSK9 inhibitors in coronary patients nowadays? Right, so the, I think this, yeah, this is quite an open question. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think, uh, as it was discussed in the in the previous session, I think uh, it, these are drugs that have a right to stay, and we will uh, start using more. And probably it is because of the costs that are limiting more widely the use of the of these drugs. But probably I think if the costs were not so so high, probably it would be much more uh, expanded. And for example, uh, I think, for example, this PCSK9 consensus from the ESC is, is quite restrictive or yeah. considered substantially high LDL cholesterol to start this therapy. So maybe this should be revised. And now that we have the, the data from, from the Odyssey outcomes as well, and secondary uh, also group analysis from the Fourier as well, probably should be revised and, and discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, just one word. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the uh, great possibility or the great achievement that we can obtain with PSK, PCSK9 inhibitor is to improve our treatment with the treatment that we have. Yeah. In the sense that is a really a good opportunity yeah. because uh, if you look at the uh, observational data, cardiology registry, or even more in the real world data, uh, the rate of patient after an ACS treated appropriately, we starting is very low. Uh, the dosages are generally lower than those dosages uh, useful to reach the target, and there is also a poor adherence, seventy percent of adherence over one year after an ACS. Uh, so I think that uh, to have the possibility to prescribe a new drug, you have to treat it the best with the traditional drugs. Yeah. And this is probably the best opportunity that we have due to PSK9 inhibitors. But, but do you think that the, the, yeah. the tax for the European society is, do you think it's too much restrictive in the, yeah. in the daily practice of Yes, with respect to the uh, to the uh, label of yeah. FDA, yeah, it's yeah. surely more restrictive. The label is uh, uh, surely more liberal, yeah. and uh, also with respect uh, uh, to the uh, rules that in Italy has been established for prescribing this kind of drugs. Are, but uh, I think that the concept. Yeah to use appropriately what we have at low cost uh, yeah, is very sure. important. Yeah. 
Joao wants Even to if make... this is a good uh, tool, of course, it's yeah. a good drag. Joao? Joao? Yes, only, only one comment. Uh, to, to, to agree or to tell the, in this regard. Uh, Joao. It is clear. It, it press the button. Sure. Yeah, it's okay. No, no it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, uh, it's like a joke you are saying in Portugal that uh, the major implication of all these outcomes is increase on azitimab in Portugal. Uh, because the concept of very low LDL in patients after acute coronary syndrome is, is a major conclusion of these trials. So uh, we need to, 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 to manage these patients properly and the use of a very high dose of statins is not common in Portugal and the combination with ZMI is also not common in Portugal. So um, PCSK9 inhibitors are not, still, not um, available in Portugal yet and uh, there's a tremendous discussion on these drugs how to handle this. I don't know exactly. I, of course, we have a niche of patients for, for this kind of drugs, but I not expect that you are using so much this kind of drug. You are, and one question about uh, Kanakikumab. What's your personal impression? You, we know that Novartis even don't know what to do with the drug, but... but I have an opinion. No, nobody, knows, nobody knows what to do with the drug. <laughs> um, <coughs> the, the results are, are really good. The, the trial is published and the results are, are really good. But um, we, are, we are handling with a new drug, with a new class of drugs, a, a, a lot of things that are definitely unknown with this kind of drugs regarding side effects and so on. And uh, we don't know exactly the price and probably this Very means high. a lot, a lot of money to reduce a few percent of that. So I cannot expect so much of this drug. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> nowadays inflammation is uh, the, the hot topic in atherosclerosis. And, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the problem will be the price. And uh, the, the use of PCK9 inhibitors will be, a, a, you know, a children's play in, in, in comparison with the, with the price of uh, these new drugs. And um, so either uh, we find <clears throat> a niche of uh, a very reduced number of patients with a tremendous response, genotyping the patients or whatever, or uh, there will be another opportunity for some anti-inflammatory drugs that uh, mimics the effect of these monoclonal antibodies, uh, especially acting through interle inhibiting interleukin-6. And that is the case of colchicine, which is, or methotrexate. And the, the, the cost of colchicine is uh, if uh, you don't want the, 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 uh, the paper box, is, uh, the, the cost will be nil. So there is an ongoing trial now, that, that, that is the cold call trial, that is exploring the, the effects of colchicine in secondary prevention. And uh, let's see what happened, you know. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, open is, uh, the, the door is open to explore a new mechanism of action and a new intervention uh, controlling inflammation in, uh, in patients with uh, chronic ischemic heart disease or acute ischemic heart disease. You have the, the, the last question, but what do you think about that, how to translate the COMPASS results into clinical practice? How to identify the patients? Because this is a big issue. Several times were, was discussed this data he, the, today and yesterday, but nobody knows how to translate really this data into clinical practice. The, the, the easier way to respond to our question is to say that all the patients with stable coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease um, are, are candidates, and diabetes are candidates for the COMPASS uh, approach. Um, uh, of course not, because the question, the question now um, is to balance between these two regimes, dual antiplatelet therapy and the possibility to extend to antiplatelet therapy or switch to a new opportunity combined with a low dose of rioxaban plus, plus aspirin. Um, the, question, the question for me, and uh, when we look at the practical implications of COMPASS trial, is exactly to define what really means a stable patient, and particularly what is the, where is the transition period between the acute phase and the stable phase. Because uh, we have a lot of evidence to show that it's possible to shorten dual antiplatelet therapy. The new stents are really good and the thrombogenesis of these new stents are very low. So it's possible to reduce 
um, do anti plasma therapy and probably to switch for a, a new regime combining low dose of rioxaban plus aspirin uh, between the between the coronary signals before the end of first year. Um, but I, I don't know exactly what kind of patient. We have good, of course, peripheral arterial disease, a good opportunity because there is a lack of our knowledge in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Um, only aspirin or clopidogrel uh, are good in this kind of patient and nothing, nothing really good in peripheral arterial disease. But in coronary heart disease in patients, particularly coronary heart disease with other risk factors, particularly diabetes, this is a good alternative and you should think about this, this alternative. Yeah. It's a really good alternative. Well, uh, the results are, are tremendous. Uh, yeah. Reduction on, on cardiovascular death. So this is really, really yeah. good. The problem is that we have a price to pay. Yes, is the bleeding. yes of course. Yeah. Of course, the risk of bleeding, once again, once again, the risk of bleeding is, is very, very high. And um, the, the other issue is about, um, okay, how, how, to, how to balance the risk of thrombosis and, and the risk of bleeding. We don't know exactly how to balance this. You, you are discussing scores. Okay, but the scores, uh, scores are good to predict the risk of bleeding, but not to balance bleeding versus ischemia. A final comment, Jose Luis? Well, yeah, the, I, I think the door has been open to explore uh, or the idea that uh, maybe uh, what we need is a combination of a very low dose of antithrombotic agent, uh, anticoagulants, uh, with, uh, with uh, some uh, um, strong, uh, let's say, at least anti-aggregant, rather than use two or three anti-aggregants uh, together, you know. So that is, uh, you know, if you consider the ATLAS trial as well, you know, there is a very low dose of antithrombing agents along with asping or a, 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 a ticagrel or a clopidogrel or, or prasugrel may be a better combination than uh, aspirin plus uh, a P2I12 inhibitor. Yeah. You, you. Just, just a brief comment. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, uh, the, uh, probably the concept deriving from Compass, yeah. deriving from Pegasus, and even from the subgroup analysis of charisma for the patient with a previous uh, coronary event. Uh, I think that probably it is the aspirin alone, uh, we can do better than doing aspirin alone. Now the, uh, the problem is to select uh, which kind of strategy uh, to select for each patient, yeah. uh, increasing the activity of aspirin. Aspirin probably is not sufficient uh, to uh, reduce the residual risk mm -hmm. that was described before. And for the bleeding, uh, probably the strong excess of bleeding <coughs> was due also to the definition that the uh, operational committee uh, we decided to have in the trial, uh, because adding uh, all the cases of bleeding uh, in which it was needed an admission to an emergency room, there were a lot of uh, epistasis or small <laughs> hemorrhages uh, going to the emergency room and uh, this was the major cause of the excess because the fatal bleeding or the hemorrhagic stroke or the uh, bleedings in the very important organs were not different. Yeah, you have to close the, this session. Thanks all of, all of, of you okay. for remaining here to this, to this time. Um, now we have a, a dinner at 9.30, I think, and we see you tomorrow at 9 in the morning. Good night.